This <laughs> message comes from Matthew chapter 11, 1 through 15. God. When Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, to, to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This is the word of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, make your face to shine upon us, for we are yours. Without your blessing, we have no hope. We need you every moment of our lives. And to be obedient people, to live our life worthy of the calling, we need your blessing, your power, your work in our hearts. So Lord, I pray for these people here, and I pray for myself to deliver your word faithfully and truthfully. For the glory of your name that you place upon us, for the sake of Christ Jesus, who brought us into this covenant with God. Oh Lord, speak to us and give us life in him. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to jump into our passage, and um, the passage we just read as we are going through this Matthew series, the story is somewhat shocking to the early church, to the Bible readers, to me, to most of us, because here in this story, the one who questioned Jesus whether he is really the Messiah or not is no other but the John the Baptist. John the Baptist. He was in a prison and he sent some of his disciples to Jesus and asked the question, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? How can John the Baptist questioning Jesus, the authenticity of Jesus, whether he's really Messiah or not, if we read the Bible in the Gospel of Luke, the angel Gabriel appeared to Zechariah, who is the father of John, before John was conceived, before the birth of John. And this is what angel Gabriel said about John in Luke 1, 16. It says, And he, John, will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And John, he will go before him in the spirit and power of Eliza to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord of people prepared. And if you read further in the Gospel of Luke, after John was born, he went into the wilderness, lived in the wilderness, prepared himself, his life, to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was trained for that. He lived for that mission. 
That was what's been said about John before his birth. His entire life is about that. And John said in the Gospel of John 1, the next day he, John, saw Jesus, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, this is what John the Baptist said about Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that we are talking about. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, Jesus. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptized with the Holy Spirit, and I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the words of John the Baptist towards Jesus. I've seen it. I've seen the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus, and I was told that he is it. And he told, he preached to the people, this is the Son of God. And he heard the voice in the Jordan River. Father God saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. What a special experience John the Baptist had. His whole life was about that. He experienced his special revelation, the glory of Jesus Christ as a son of God. How can he, after all, questioning Jesus, are you the one or not? What? And we can find a hint of why he was questioning him in verse 2 of our passage. Would you look at verse 2? Let's not overlook it. Verse 2 says this. Now when John heard in the prison about the deeds of Christ, about the deeds of Christ, when John heard about what Jesus was doing, it did not fit with John's expectation. Jesus was not doing what John expected him to do. The things he's doing is like, wait a second, that's not what I wanted or expected him to do. So he's questioning. Then what was John's expectation on Jesus? We can see that from the preaching of John in the Jordan River, when he was in Jordan River baptizing people, Matthew 3, 12, part of it, it says this, His widowing, the Messiah's widowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Judgment of the wicked, salvation of the righteous. His, his wheat will gather into barn, salvation of the righteous, but the judgment will burn the way of the wicked. Punishment. The Messiah will come and he will do that. But Jesus was not doing that. Man, I've been, I've been serving God all my life, suffering, going through this tough time. I was in the wilderness to serve God, but me right now in a prison. But the wicked and sinners, evil people, they prosper. They're living in security. They're making a lot of money. They're living a good life. But one who tries to serve God is suffering. And John said, Hold on, if when Messiah come, after he's going to straight this up and say punishment and salvation. But he's not doing it. That was John's issue with Jesus Christ. John was in a prison at the blink of death by the King Herod Antipas. And he's thinking, Jesus, he's not doing it. What is he doing? John was upset with this. John was frustrated with Jesus. How do I know that? Look at verse 6 of our passage. Jesus said, Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The word offended here, in the Greek word, 
in the original language is scandalizo. Sounds familiar? Sounds like English word? Scandal. Scandalizing. Scandalizo. It's a strong word in Greek, meaning something is being filled with disgust, reversion, like to, and it can read to the point that you reject the person completely. This is so scandalous. I can't take this. Strong, offensive word. Mm. Blessed is the one who is not scandalous by me. Now, Jesus is scandalous to many people in this world. He is. He's scandalous because Jesus is so outside of their boxes. They just don't, they just, just cannot keep him in, in their mind, in their box. A rich young man came to Jesus thinking that he's pretty good. I kept all God's commandment and he asked Jesus, how can I receive the eternal life? How can I have eternal life? Thinking that, you know what, I'm a pretty good person. I just need to have a little bit more addition. I, I feel like I'm missing a little tiny thing. So I've done that, I've done that. Jesus, what do I need to do? I'm a pretty good guy. I'm a religious person. I serve God. And you know what Jesus says? It's, he did not give little thing that he needs to add or change. This is what Jesus says. Go sell all your possessions, give to the poor, and you come and follow me. And this man grieved, walked away. This is not a little change. This is not a little addition. This life needs to be completely changed. You are serving money, not God. For some, they took offense at Jesus because Jesus did not give what they wanted. In the Gospel of John 6, verse 66, after this, many of disciples turned back and no longer walked with Jesus. We wanted this from Jesus, and Jesus is not giving them what they wanted. For the religious people, the cross is scandalous. That is not what they want. The Son of God, the Holy One, the God Almighty, the God of our Israel, God of our Father, in the human flesh, is cursed on the tree, shamed, naked, killed by the hands of the pagan idolater, idol truth, Roman soldiers, God dying on the cross in that form, I cannot accept this. To the Jews, this is scandalous. The cross, the message of the cross. Jesus is scandalous to religious leaders as well. Because Jesus did not support their Judaism. He did not support their tradition, their strict practice on Sabbath. What they were forcing upon the people, rather Jesus exposed their hypocrisy, the hidden sin. Still, to many people today, the message of the gospel, the message of Jesus is still offensive. Jesus is offensive because what you need to hear when you come to Jesus is saying that you are a sinner, you deserve the wrath of God, you think you are good? No. I'm a pretty decent person. I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm a good guy. And what I hear when I come to Christianity to just Jesus is, I'm in the horrible, terrible condition situation. I deserve God's wrath and eternal hell. I don't want to hear that. Jesus is so countercultural. Brothers and sisters, when Jesus does not meet your expectations, I think this is who Jesus is. People have their own version. I think who is who Jesus is. When Jesus does not meet your expectation, how do you respond? At one level, there are people like Judas Iscariot. Church, Judas, Judas followed Jesus. He followed Jesus. 
He was in Jesus' ministry. He was sitting there listening to Jesus' sermon. Day after day, week after week. He was there, learned from Jesus. He was there when Jesus healed people, cast out demons. He followed Jesus. Judah was there in the boat when Jesus walked on the water or when Jesus calmed the stone. Judah was there, probably I'm guessing, he was at some point he was excited about the Jesus' ministry, what he is doing. I'm guessing that's why Judah was there for all those years. But he was a superficial follower. Over a period of time, he realized Jesus is not the one I expected him to be. It seems like Jesus is not going to do in a way that I want him to do. Wait a second. Who is this Jesus? How come he's not doing this? And then he walked away. Judah had a different agenda in the whole time, actually. He was serving, chasing, following something else other than Jesus. He was serving money. The scripture actually said that Judah was a thief, that he took money from the money box of the ministry money for himself. And he was willing to betray Jesus for money. So whole time he was physically actually following Jesus, but actually he was serving, following money. He was a branch that did not abide in Jesus. He was a branch that did not bear any fruit of life, any good fruit, to cut and throw into a fire. And there are, even today, superficial followers. I want this from Jesus. I want him to be like this, to do that in my life. And they may be in church for years, for years, and realize, Wait a second, this is not what I signed up for. Wait a second, my life is not turning out in a way that I want God to do in my life. Forget it. Because actually all time, what I was serving and chasing after is not God. It's not Jesus the person. It's something else what I wanted to have in my life. There are people. Jesus, if you are for me, you will bless my business. If you are for me, you will make me happy. You will help me to get good husband, good wife, good family, decent lifestyle. Man, for that, I, you know, God... I served in the church. I was in the children's ministry. I did this and that. And I prayed so hard. I gave so much tithing and offering. God, how come you don't get me this? These people are getting, these people are enjoying. How come I'm not married? How come my business is always suffering? Why? I was like, forget this. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Wait. On the other hand, some true Christians, even true Christians have issues, can have issues with Jesus. Struggle in Christianity. And it's not necessary because their expectation of Jesus is wrong, unbiblical, out of their wrong, selfish, lustful motivation. It's not. Actually, their expectation on Jesus is biblical, good. True and right. Actually here, John's expectation on Jesus was a biblical one. It's all right. It's true. God made Jesus to be the judge of all. The living and the dead. That's what Jesus will do. Jesus will gather his people into barn and burn all the wicked. He will bring judgment. Jesus will do that. John's expectation on the Messiah, the Messiah will do that, is not wrong. It's not heretical. It's just not, it was not being done in a way that John wanted to see. John had the right theology. 
your struggle and my struggle, our struggle can come from the right theology. For example, we truly believe the promise is here. I say, pray in my name. I will hear and answer. Pray for the sick. Pray for each other. Believe in Jesus, you have soul shall be saved. We pray, Lord, I believe when I pray, you hear my prayer. So that's why we are praying, right? That's the right theology. God answers our prayer. I'm praying for the sick. I'm praying for the cancer. I'm praying for the protection. I'm praying for the provision. I'm praying for my children. I'm praying for they turn out to be good, to love God. I'm praying for my family member who is not a believer yet. Lord, I'm praying according to your word, based on your promise. But I see time to time in Christian life, we see the discrepancy between my theology, what I believe, and what it seems like going on in my life. What's going on? Oh, what is, what, what, what's going on? What are you doing? You said. I thought this is biblical. This is right. Well, we are not the only one. The psalmist in the psalm, the singers in the psalm, the writer of the psalm, they fell in that way. God, you are with me, but where are you? They cried out, where are you, God? I feel like I'm so depressed. I feel like I'm going to the pit. I'm going to the grave. Who's going to praise you in the grave? Where are you in my life? Apostle Paul, scripture says he prayed to God three times earnestly. For God to remove the thorn of his flesh. Well, actually, the English translation of thorn is, does not do justice there. Because when we think about thorn, we don't think about, you know, tiny thorn in a rose or something like that. Actually, the word thorn is not like a little tiny thorn. Ah, no, it, it means like spear. A piercing him. Creating so much pain. So Paul the Apostle Paul, pray to God. Please, this is the thorn in my flesh. This is creating so much pain in my life. Would you remove that three times? And what was God's answer? No. No? No? My grace is sufficient for you because my power made my power is made perfect in your weakness. Brother sister, are you with me? It was God's will for Paul to remain in weakness. It was God's will Paul to remain in suffering. In weakness. No, Paul. then would you be angry with God? Or would you still trust him and be faithful to him? It will surely be disappointing, but not like Judah walking away. The true believer will still abide in the Lord. Pay attention to the answer of Jesus what Jesus said to the disciple of John, to tell John. Now, notice, are you the one or shall we wait for another one? Jesus did not give an answer. It's like, yes, I am the one. He did not say that. Rather, he responded in this way. You turn to your passage again, verse 4. And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. So, Go, bear witness, you, what you hear, what you see, not just deliver what I say, but what you hear and what you see. And then he says, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. 
This is not, Jesus is not just giving a description of his ministry, what he's doing. This is a brilliant response of Jesus to John the Baptist. Jesus was actually going into the heart of John's struggle, John's issue with Jesus. Because this expression, church, is reminding John and us of Isaiah 35. For example, brothers and sisters, if I say, the Lord is my shepherd, he will guide me in the green pasture and the stream of water, they remind you, oh, that kind of expression, like, remind me of Psalm 23. Probably John knew the Old Testament very well, and this expression reminded John of Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, it goes like this. Strengthen the weak sense and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With vengeance. With the, re with the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mule sing for joy, for waters break forth in the wilderness, and the streams in the desert. Mm. Yes, blind see, deaf hear, this is the ministry of Jesus, what Messiah will do. But Jesus is, and the Jesus is doing that, but he is referring, Jesus is referring to this passage because John's struggle is what you see exactly in verse 4. Say to those who have anxious heart, be strong and fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and save you. Then, do you see that? Then the eyes of the blind. So John is thinking, God making vengeance against the wicked, against the sinners and the evil. And then healing and then restoration. It's got to come. So that is why John is having a problem with Jesus. Hello, the vengeance of God has got to come first, Jesus. I'm in the prison by the evil king. I'm suffering. Where is the vengeance? Where is this? No, your God will come and save you. Where is my saving me? Well, Jesus in our passage said about John, John is like Elijah. You, see, you saw that? You know, if you have... Years, you know, John was the Eliza to come. John was really like the Eliza in terms of John had the spirit of Elijah. This was the problem Elijah too, that Elijah had. You read the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah, what was the issue that Elijah had with God? It was this. Elijah was furious. Elijah was disappointed. He said, God, how come you don't send the fire and burn away all these idol worshippers and all these evil people and punish them and judge them? Rather, Elijah had to run away from these people, hide this place, that place, because the king evil Ahab was chasing after Elijah. Say, Elijah, God, what are you doing, God? How come just come down and punish all these people? John was just like Elijah. His issue was that. Now, this is beautiful. Look how Elijah 35 passage ends. Let me, not Elijah, Isaiah 35. Isaiah 35, verse 10. This probably John knew this passage. And at the end of that, Isaiah 35, verse 10 says this And the ransomed. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and singing. Sighting shall flee away. Hmm. Do you know what the word ransom means? Ransomed. It means people being delivered, saved. Because the price is paid for them. Slave, shackled, paying the price, ransom. This was like Jesus saying to John, John, good news is being preached to the poor. 
restoration and salvation to the blind, the lame, leper, mute, whom the Jews often despise them, thinking that they are blind, they are mute, they are suffering like this because they are sinners. God is punishing them. They were born in sin. They live in sin. That's why these bad things happen. That's why they are poor. God did not bless them, punish them. But John, you see, not the self-righteous people, not the religious people who think who can be right with God by themselves by doing religious work, but the poor, but the mute, the blind, who humble themselves, who desperately come to me. I need your grace. I need your healing. I need you, Lord. They are the ones who are accepted in the kingdom of God, John. John, if I bring vengeance, if I bring the punishment, the judgment, right now, who can stand before the Holy One, who is perfectly righteous. No one, not even you, John. The poor are accepted, the sinners are accepted because I am going to face the judgment of God on myself. They will be ransomed. I will pay the price for them and they will come to God with joy and singing. Those who are humble, those who come to me will be ransomed. Church, I don't know how far John would understand this. In life, you cannot figure out everything what your master is doing. You cannot figure out everything. Sometimes we realize after all, a few years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, we look back and then we realize, oh, I see what God was doing at that time. Oh, I see how he come together in mix. But the other times, you will never know what he was about, not until you die. Not until you go to heaven. What, what, what was it about? When, brothers and sisters, hear me. When Jesus does not do according to your expectation, he's up to something far greater than your expectation. And he's not obligated to explain it to you, everything what he's doing. Another fascinating thing is here, lastly, I just want to point out, in this passage is the compliment of Jesus on John. He said John is more than a prophet. There's no one greater than John among those who were born of the woman. Wow. That's high praise. That's a great compliment. Isn't it? Nobody is greater than John among those who have been born of the woman. But what he said after that is more fascinating and shocking because he said, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. Christians, believers in Christ, are greater than John. John was the usher of Christ's kingdom. But the believers in Christ actually partaker of the kingdom. We enter into the kingdom. John was a great prophet pointing to Christ and the kingdom. But we, in the new covenant, we are in the kingdom. Church, John was great among those who were born of the woman. But Christians, believers, we are born of the Spirit. Born again by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual birth is greater than the natural birth. Now, hold on. What do you mean? What do you mean, Billy? Let me say it this way. 
I notice that many people wonder, what if my faith is not authentic, genuine, real? Do I have real faith? Am I a real believer? They wonder, like, am I really a real, authentic Christian? Is my faith really is? I can give you a few ways how you can know whether, how you, whether your faith is real or not, but I just I don't have time to do all that, so I'll just tell you one thing. One thing how we can know whether our faith is real or not. According to 1 Peter 1 through 5, it says, this, Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. One way that you can know about your faith is whether it is real or not is through trials, being tested, hardships, suffering, and it will show when you are put it in there, when your days are filled with tears, when your heart is troubled, you will know what you have. What I have is real faith or not. Because the real faith is still even the moment. It doesn't make sense. I don't know. God is not doing according to my expectation. And I don't know what's going to happen. But they will still long for the Lord. They will still love the Lord. They will still put their hope in the Lord. It's been tested. Genuineness of your faith. And then verse 8 there's, says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him. John the Baptist saw the glory of Christ. The Holy Spirit, voice of Father, beautiful revelation of Jesus Christ. All his entire life was trained and prepared for that. But Christians... Many countless Christians never had that experience, never even saw the face of Jesus or heard the voice of Jesus. But even the point of death, even when they were being persecuted, being killed, they still trusted, loved Jesus. Because for by the grace and the work of the Holy Spirit, something was being done in them. And I see it. John was great among those who are born of the woman. But the, even the least one in the kingdom of heaven has greater faith than John. Is greater than John. That's the grace we have received in the Lord. The work of the Spirit in us. Let's pray.